Good morning. Welcome to the session on methods. Uh, our first presenter is Blair Fix from York University. He'll be talking about a real world, real world theory of income distribution. Thank you. So uh, what I mean by a real world theory of income distribution is that it's um, based on a very few, two or three actually, observations about the real world that I think are objectively true, that there's enormous amount of evidence to, uh, to back up. And uh, you can just maybe contrast this with the popular theories of income distribution, which are mostly uh, personal income distribution, which are the big one is human capital theory. And I think that um, really has no basis, in fact. So I'm not going to talk about alternative theories because I have a lot of data to show you. But um, that's what I mean when I'm talking about a real world theory. So some observations about the real world on which I'm going to base my, uh, my model. Uh, people work in firms, at least in the modern era. This is, the firm is the dominant institution of, uh, of capitalism. And, and what firm you work at has a tremendous um, effect on your income. So if you work at um, McDonald's, for instance, no matter what position you have in McDonald's, you're probably going to make less than somebody who works at Goldman Sachs. And so there's a distribution of pay between firms. Some firms paying on average much more, and some firms on average paying much less. So this model that I'm going to construct basically assumes that where you work has an important effect on your income, and that there's basically a distribution of firm pay. And the second observation which is not a new observation by any means, is that firms are orga organized hierarchically, which basically means there's a tree-like structure with a, a CEO at the top and um, basically fanning down to the base. And it's, it's a, based on this idea of the span of control, which is a ratio between any given uh, supervisor and those under him. And in this model, I assume that all firms are basically identical in their span of control. And that's just a simplifying assumption, of course. In the real world, this would obviously vary. But we don't have a lot of data on how it varies, unfortunately. And the last assumption um, is that firm pay increases exponentially as you move up a hierarchy. So uh, in this chart, this is just a visualization of it, but at the base here, so I'm numbering hierarchical levels, and if you were at, started at the base, call that pay one, and pay would increase exponentially as you get up to the top, so this would maybe be the CEO. And again, this observation is not new, and there's a lot of data to back it up. So what I do in this paper is I construct a model of the economy, and I thought originally when I had done this about a year and a half ago that I was the first to do it, but I wasn't. <laughs> so Herbert Simon actually did this in the 1950s, 57 actually. Uh, and he's got more math skills than I do, but what his, basically he took, so in uh, 56, um, D.R. Roberts published some data that I've, I've shown here of how CEO pay scales with firm size. And he, mer he, he measured firm size in terms of um, sales. And here CEO pay is on the y-axis. And there's this clear, um, it's actually a power law scaling relation that he discovered. And he, he thought this could be explained with the marginal productivity theory. But Herbert Simon came along and said, well, there's an alternative explanation, which is basically what I've laid out, that we assume that firms are hierarchies and that pay increases exponentially as you go up the hierarchy. And I'm not going to go through the math, but if you do this, he, you can show that the, the logical result is that firm pay, sorry, that CEO pay should scale with firm size. And, and no matter, and 
sales is just one way of representing firm size. I'll, I'll use employment um, for my model. So Herbert Simon did this in 57, and, and a few other papers were published using this kind of hierarchical theory of the firm to gain insight into income distribution. But in terms of wider economic theory, it never really went anywhere that I'm aware of. You know, human capital theory came along and kind of dominated the show for the next 40 years. But what I'm going to do is basically expand on this, what I'm calling the Simon model. And I'm able to do basically take advantage of modern computers. So when Simon published his paper, he was doing everything analytically. So he derived, he basically uh, used equations to derive this power law. And my model, I don't do anything analytically. It's actually a, a stochastic model. And all I really do is I take this model of the firm and expand it to many, many different firms. In fact, millions of firms. And because we have powerful computers now, we can do this very easily. So we, we can actually model the entire economy uh, in terms of a, a conglomerate or a distribution of firms and then some sort of hierarchical structure within the firm. So I'm just going to show you the algorithm and uh, very quickly, and if we want to discuss the specifics of it, maybe we can do that in, uh, after in questions. So th the basic idea, so the entire model is stochastic in that every choice about, um, every choice comes from some sort of distribution. So uh, um, for instance, we start with a firm size distribution. And, and this is a power law uh, based on the US, but it's widely recognized that firm size is distributed according to a power law. So in the model, we draw a firm randomly from a, a power law distribution. And, and visually, I've, we've got a firm here of a size of 400. And each dot is a, a person. So we have 400 people drawn randomly. And then I have an algorithm to arrange that, those people, into a hierarchy. So here now we have levels going up to the top, to the CEO, and down to the base. So we arrange people into a hierarchy. And then we randomly assign a base pay. So I build pay from the bottom up in this model. And base pay is, again, um, stochastically distributed. I, I based it on empirical data, but it's a, it's a log normal distribution. But anyway, in this um, visualization, let's say in the base of this firm, people on average make $10,000. The next step is to construct pay throughout the entire firm. And the way I do that is basically to draw at random what I call a pay scaling parameter, which determines how rapidly pay increases as you move up the hierarchy. So the colors here are showing you income in thousands of dollars. So there's an exponential rise in pay, but this, again, is random. So it could the pay scaling could be very steep. So very steep as we move up the hierarchy or very gradual. And there's some sort of distribution to this pay scaling. And then the last thing I do to make it realistic, again, this, this is based on empirical data, is to add dispersion uh, within each hierarchical level. Because obviously, nobody, everybody doesn't make the same amount of money within uh, a single hierarchical level. So I add dis uh, dispersion, which again is based on a, a log normal distribution. So this is I've just shown you the process for one firm of 400 people. But in the model, uh, we can use a computer to basically iterate this process over many, many, many different firms, You know, about a million or so. And when we do this, then we get a, a distribution of income of all the people in the model. And we can basically take this and compare it to empirical data. Now, of course, the model has um, quite a few parameters. And every model has to be tuned. So you, I tuned the parameters to fit specific US data. I'm going to show you this now. And first show you the fitted results. And then I'll show you the results that just happen automatically, that I didn't actually tune the model 
to do. So first of all, um, the histogram for U.S. income distribution. I didn't actually fit the histogram, but what I aimed to do was reproduce the U.S. Gini index. Uh, and this is for full-time wage and salary workers, because I didn't want to worry about unemployment um, or part-time work. So the U.S. Gini in 2007 was about 41. And I tuned the model to be roughly around that, that, um, that region. And th of course, it's stochastic, so there's fluctuations. But you can see that it produces, I mean, approximately the correct histogram of uh, U.S. income distribution, which I didn't try to do, but it just kind of happens. Uh, and then and the next thing, this is a little bit um, less obvious, so I'm going to go through this in detail, was to tune the model to reproduce the, firm's, uh, the firm size distribution of Forbes 400 individuals. So let me explain what I mean by this. Um, I went through Forbes data, so they publish their list every year of 400, the 400 wealthiest Americans. And in this list it tells you the company where <coughs> each individual earned their money. So for Bill Gates it would be Microsoft. For the Walton family it would be Walmart. So I took this data that they provide and then I went back and looked at the size of the firms for each individual. So Microsoft is about 100,000 employees, Walmart 2 million. So for I, f I could find data for about 360 people. So I then you then have basically a data set on the firm size distribution of the firms owned by these wealthy individuals. And so that's the red curve here. No, sorry, blue, blue curve. And I've shown it in a cumulative distribution. So you've got firm size down here in the bottom on a log scale and cumulative probability on the uh, x, or sorry, y-axis. So as you go along, the y tells you the proportion of firms that are smaller than any given x level. So about 50% of firms are smaller than 10,000, or 10 to the fourth. Um, okay, but then I tuned the model to reproduce this result. And I basically assumed so how did I do that? Well, in the model, I took the 400 richest people in, in every iteration of the model. And of course, th this is incomes in my model, not wealth. But we can talk about th that distinction maybe later. I don't know that it's that important. Uh, but it basically, I fitted it to reproduce this firm size distribution. And I'm not aware of any other model that can do that. So I think that on its own is interesting because it uh, allows us to make a link between wealth distribution and firm size distribution. So now predictions. So these are predictions in the sense that I didn't try to get the model to reproduce these results. It just happens once I've fitted the parameters to this other data. The first is the scaling of top incomes. So this is a, a it's called a zip chart and it basically plots we rank the 400 richest people from 1 to 400 and then we plot their, the size of their wealth on the y scale but it's normalized so that the richest person is always one so the empirical data is the blue so this would be bill gates for the most part this is the the average for the last well 1988 to 2003 so that's the blue data. So that's the scaling, which basically is a power law tail for these wealthy individuals. And the model is the red, which basically, I mean, it's not identical, but I didn't try to make it identical. But it basically produces the same, uh, same scaling of top incomes. Uh, and again, so the Forbes data is wealth in capitalization. But wealth, if you assume some rate of return, is convertible into income. So I don't think the distinction is that important. Now obviously the model reproduces CEO pay scaling. This is what Simon designed it to do in the 1950s. So this is CompuStat data. Firm size here on a log scale. And on the Y scale is the CEO to average pay ratio. So there's a lot of dispersion, but there is an overall 
upward trend when firm size increases, the CEO pay to average employee increases. And the model reproduces that scaling relation. And the slope is not identical, but um, I'm not too worried about that. The other thing the model predicts is that there should be a firm size wage gap. And this is kind of one of the most celebrated uh, findings in, uh, I guess you'd call it la labor economics, is that, um, so empirical data is here in the blue, as uh, you move to larger and larger firms, or it's usually establishments actually, uh, pay, average pay increases. Well, there's many, many different explanations of this, but it's a natural result in this model for a very simple reason. Um, larger firms have more hierarchical levels and if pay increases exponentially as you move up, then average pay is going to increase with firm size. So this is, a, the blue here is the model. And it, it's obviously not the same, I, or identical, but it's the right order of magnitude, which is a pure result of hierarchy. So there's no difference in base pay. The base pay distribution is identical. Uh, but as we get to larger and larger firms, you add more hierarchical levels and mean pay increases as a result. This is another way of kind of looking at the same, um, same problem, but expressed in a different manner. So this is empirical data for wh what I call the employee to proprietor pay gap. So employees are anybody who works for somebody else. Proprietors are people who own their own small business. So typically a firm of one or two people. There's on average a pay gap of about 1.4 between employees who make more than proprietors. And this is um, basically identically predicted by the model purely as a result of, again, hierarchy. Because in a small firm, there is no hierarchy. So I assume that they make the same base pay as the base pay in, in a giant corporation, but the giant corporation has all these other levels. So it's the same basically result expressed in a different way. Okay, so those are, I think, interesting aspects of the model, but the most interesting, at least for me, is the insights that it gives into to capitalist income in top, and the relation between capitalist income and uh, top incomes, which is something I've been uh, puzzled by for a long time. So this is data from Piketty, who's done a lot of great empirical work. Uh, so it's relating basically income percentile on the x-axis to the fraction of income that comes from capital. So this is the basic question of, of who is a capital. You know, we talk about the top 1%, and in some sense that's true. A lot of people in the top 1% are capitalist, but it's a gradient, right? There's no clear-cut distinction. So there's a gradient uh, as we move into the upper, upper incomes of who is a capitalist. And by the time you're in the top 0.01% of incomes, the majority, or about 70% of income, comes from capital. So in this model, I wanted to see if I could uh, gain some insight into capitalist income. And I will, before I show you the next slide, discuss the rationale for this. So um, <coughs> if you're at the top of a corporate hierarchy, say a CEO, you're going to often get paid in stock options. So as a result, you're going to make, a, a lot of the time, a significant portion of your income in dividends. So they're natural, and, and vice versa, if you're at the bottom of a hierarchy, you're not going to get any stock options. So we really don't expect you to have any capitalist income. So there should be a, this gradient within a corporation and throughout the, the corporate hierarchy of capitalist income. So at the top, if you're a CEO, we should expect that you're a capitalist. If you're at the bottom, you're not a capitalist. But again, this is a gradient. So what does the model have to say about this? Well, uh, let me explain this. So I took the model here, and I took Piketty's um, 
fractiles of income. So P90 to 95, 95 to 99, and so on. So you divide up income fractiles in the same way that Piketty does in my model, and I calculate the mean hierarchical level in my model. So there's some error because it's stochastic, but you can see that as uh, the income fractiles increase, as we expect, uh, the mean hierarchical level increases. But the surprising thing is that there's a virtually a perfect correlation between this increase in the model's hierarchical level and Piketty's data on capitalist income. Uh, so the correlation is, I mean, 0.996. It's ridiculously high. It's high enough uh, that we basically have a predictive variable. Um, so we can use this basically to reproduce the distribution of capitalist income. So I did that. I created a, a function that predicts the proportion that any individual earns from capitalist income. So it's basically an exponential regression from this chart. A is a some factor, or sorry, some constant. So your hierarchical level in the model is H, and K over Y is K is capital, capitalist income, Y is um, total income. So the fraction of, uh, of your income that you earn from capitalist income is K over Y, and this is the predictive variable in the model H. So I use this regression and this formula to derive in the model the distribution of, of property income. And I call it property because that is the way the U.S. accounts are uh, organized. So it basically produces the model, here is in uh, red, virtually identically the, um, the same power law sca scaling in property distribution, sorry, property income distribution, which is completely different from the distribution of total income. So property income distribution is very, very unequally distributed. So I didn't put the Gini index, but it's like 0.7, whereas income distribution is about 0.4, or depending how you tabulate it, okay? But the model basically allows us to move from the total distribution of income and predict the distribution of property income. Okay, but we can go further than that and this is a, a chart that um, <coughs> I published on the Capitalist Power website. I guess it was about two years ago, uh, showing the relation between top one percent income, which, in, which is red in the U.S., and net dividends as a share of capitalist income. So there's a tight, tight correlation between the two, and. <coughs> The model can actually give us some insight into why this is the case. If you think about it, again, um, a CEO is going to earn a lot in stock options. If dividends on those stock options increase, they're going to differentially benefit compared to somebody who, own, who basically earns no stock options. Now, CEOs are almost are all ba basically automatically in the top 1% anyway. So there's this kind of automatic relationship if you look in at this thinking of, of differential distribution of, of dividends throughout um, the, uh, the corporation. But that's, okay, I'm going to basically derive this relationship in reverse because in the model I have no parameter for dividends. It, there's, it's not in the model, but what I do have a parameter is for pay scaling within the firm, which determines how rapidly, so this is hierarchical level on the x-axis. The pay scaling parameter de determines how rapidly pay increases as you move up the hierarchy. Okay. And this is, I can change this. So if I change it to a greater parameter, uh, obviously pay is going to increase much more rapidly. So what I did was I shifted this parameter, and then I used my regression from before about the relation between dividends or capitalist income and hierarchy to basically predict. Now, so this uh, inset model is showing you this data here 
as a regression, and the blue, uh, sorry, the gray band is the prediction interval. And the uh, colored line here, or the colored dots, is showing you the model when I change the, the pay scaling parameter. And it basically reproduces the uh, more or less correct relation between the dividend share of national income and the top 1% income share. So there's a lot to unpack here. I think I'm out of time. So maybe we can talk about it during questions. Thank you. Our next presenter is Shai Gorski from Duke University. He'll be talking about regimes of differential accumulation and hidden Markov models. Good morning. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs> what? Okay. Oh, you don't hear? You hear too well. <laughs> okay. As the title of my presentation suggests, I'm going to discuss regimes of differential accumulation. I'm going to suggest some preliminary models using hidden Markov models. So, first I want to mo motivate a bit why, I want to, why is it that I want to discuss these notions of breadth and depth, which are a rather high level of abstraction, and I think you need to argue for it. So, just a quick reminder, Bichler and Nitzan suggest that differential capitalization is the ultimate capitalist yardstick, denoted here as DK. And that is another basic form of the capitalization equation or the discount formula that we've seen some, a few times during this conference, which suggests that the differential capitalization is determined as differential profits, DE, times the differential hype, divided by the differential risk. Now, the profits are a key component in the capitalization, and analyzing it has key significance, of course. And one way to think about how to analyze profits is to break it into a differential profits per employee times differential employment. What do I mean? Differential profits per employee are the differential profits, uh, the, sorry, the, different, the profits, the average profits of dominant firms divided by the average employment of average firms. <coughs> sorry. That is divide, and that is divided by the differential profits of all firms divided by the average employment of all firms. This is the differential profits per employee, and that is multiplied by the differential employment. Now, again, that may look vacuous. Why are we, I mean, if you just cancel the terms on the right-hand term, you get the left-hand the left hand side. But this, the idea is that this particular <coughs> breakdown of the profits is very meaningful. Why so? So before I'll say, I mean, just before I say why so, an increase or a set of tactics that is aiming at increasing differential employment is termed in capitalist power as a breadth regime of differential accumulation. And an increase in differential profits per employee is defined as a depth regime of differential accumulation. And the, going back to the why so, the why so is a very ambitious argument in a way that the interplay of these two dimensions for differential accumulation allow us to historicize at least the entire history of, I mean, the main axes of, I mean, the main stories in political economy in the 20th century. What do I mean by that? If we look at the history of the 20th century, one identified period is the welfare state or the Keynesian warfare, welfare warfare state compared to the neoliberal era. And many, most, and I'm not even talking about mainstream theories, but uh, radical theories sometimes have a difficulty in bridging what is, what is it, why is it that one time we have this type of capitalism, when, why is it that another time we have another type of capitalism? And Nitzan and Bichler suggest two proxies to measure these differential breadth and differential uh, depth regimes of accumulation. And these two proxies are the buy-to-build ratio, which measures mergers and acquisitions as a, as a part of uh, domestic investment. Every, all, all my series are from the US. And a stagflation index, which is 
some sort of an average between unemployment and inflation. And if we look at this brilliant picture, we see that the welfare state, the high time of the golden age of capitalism from the 50s to the 70s, is characterized by a higher buy to build ratio and a lower stagflation index. And the, I don't know, the dark ages of the oil crisis at the 70s and 80s is characterized by high stagflation and lower mergers and acquisitions. And again, there's much, to be, much more to be said about this, but the idea is that the interplay between these two encapsulates the story of control and resist, of capitalist control and resistance to a large extent. So that makes it a worthy topic for subject and I think justifies the higher level of abstraction and leads me to my next question. What, what we haven't seen in capitalist power, for instance, is how these two measures, these two proxies of uh, by to build index of the stagflation index, how they, do, they, do they relate to the actual measures of differential profits? So my first observation is to look at these two same indices. We start from 1950 because we have differential uh, profits data from 1950. So the, this, again, the orange line is the stagflation index, the blue line is the buy to build ratio, and the green line are the differential profits of the top 100 CompuServe firms benchmarked against all registered firms. Now, just by looking at this picture, one striking correlation jump, I mean, appears immediately, and is that the buy-to-build ratio and the differential profits of the top 100 firms seem to be pretty closely related. And when I try to see how, I mean, just by examining it visually to think about how the stagflation index might fit in a story, it's not that clear. So my first regression was to just, uh, my first benchmark regression, which will appear again and again as a benchmark throughout this presentation, is to regress the, differ the differential profits of the top 100 firms only on the buy to build indicator. And the results are pretty impressive to start with. We have a very, a very a positive and seemingly very significant relation between the two. And the R squared from the regression is 0 0.73, meaning that if we were to take the fit uh, of, from the correlation, we, uh, from, sorry, the regression, we'd, we'd get a correlation of 0 0.85, just between the, the earnings of the, the profits of the top 100 firms and the buy to build ratio. Nice start. If we add to the same regression the stagflation index, so now we have a slightly more elaborate model, we have still that the two seem to be very significant, the two seem to be very, the, the two are positive, we get a slight improvement in the R squared from the regression and a slight improvement to 0 0.97 in the correlation between the, prof, the differential profits and the fitted series. I've added here these two criteria of the AAC and BAC which suppo are supposed to penalize models for adding variables and both of these suggest that we are not doing worse and slightly better. Okay, so far so good. So this is my benchmark regression, and now I'm going to actually start my, my work in my presentation. This, by the way, is the fit from the, from the two, from regressing the profits of the top 100 firms on the buy to build indicator and the stagflation. It's a very nice picture. Okay, now, what happens when we look my, my starting point for this, for, for this work is what happens when we look at the actual differential depth, breadth, and compare the, uh, depth and breadth in the sense of looking at the actual measures, differential employment and differential profits per, per employee from the CompuState data. What happens if we compare those to the two proxies? And the answer here is muddy. I mean, if we look at these four series, perhaps the only, the only immediate connection that we can see is that the differential earnings per employee, the differential depth in the lighter green line seems to be in tandem with the buy to build ratio. And that, by the way, is counterintuitive from, I mean, the buy to build ratio is mainly supposed to be a proxy for the breadth regime. Other than that, by simple evaluation and by simple regressions, I don't see much. Maybe there isn't much to see when we use simpler tools. And that brings me to my second part. My second part of my motivation in this presentation is why I want to do fancier statistics. 
And well, I want to do fancier statistics because simple analyses don't give me mean results which I find meaningful enough in explaining the connection between the, pro between the proxies and the actual measures of uh, differential accumulation. What can I learn? What, how can we improve our understanding of these variables by a more sophisticated model? And that comes in, different, in several levels. One level is what can we say if, if and what can we say more about the relation between the two proxies themselves. How do we relate that to the actual measures of differential employment and differential profits per employee? And these seem, these, I mean, all these questions branch in many ways. One of them is to our, the essence of the definition of dominant capitals, which appears again and again in empirical work. And every time you try to benchmark or decide what is dominant capital and how to benchmark it, you might get very different results on the nature of systemic crisis or when, which firms do well when. And so these are, I think, fundamental questions to the framework of capitalist power. And the more sophisticated model that I decided to use for this presentation is to try to implement some hidden Markov models. For that, I'll need to present quickly what are Markov chains before we can discuss hidden Markov models. So a Markov chain essentially, I'm going to give the simplest form of that, which is something that I, I don't use something which is much more uh, sophisticated than, than a simple uh, mark, hidden Markov model. A Markov chain has two states, state zero and state one. At every point in time, we are at one of these two alternating states. Every at, every, at the end of every time period, we flip a biased coin, which has a probability of P zero, to stay in the same state, or of a prob probability of one minus p zero to move to the other state. If we stayed at the same at state zero, suppose we had heads with probability p zero, we're staying at the same state, and we'll run the same, we'll th t toss the same biased coin again at the next time period. If we move to state one, similarly, we have another biased coin with a different probability that will tell us if we stay at state one or go back to state zero. That's essentially a Markov chain, nothing too complicated. Now this entire logic of, that I try to describe can be succinctly um, uh, presented in a transition matrix. We move from state zero to state zero with probability P zero. We move from state one, say, to probability state two, state zero with probability one minus P one, okay? Good. Now, a hidden Markov model. So what we see here in the top part of our chart is the same Markov chain that we've seen before. We start at state zero, and with probability, if we did get heads with probability P zero, we move to state zero, we might move to state one, zero, and so on and so forth. At each point in time, each of the states is associated with one of two probability distributions. State zero, say, with the higher one to the, the left probability distribution. And if we get, if we are at state zero, we choose this probability distribution and draw a random number from this probability distribution. We move to state zero again, we stay at the same probability distribution, draw another number from it, move to state one, we go to state to the probability distribution that is associated with the state, the first state, and choose and draw a random number from this distribution this time, and so on and so forth ad infinitum. So why is this called the hidden Markov model? Because this is what we know about the world. We only have these numbers, and this entire structure, elaborate structure of chains and distributions is, in a sense, in our imagination. And doing statistics is trying to evaluate how well <coughs> these numbers might correspond, and I mean, to such a model which is characterized by parameters, of course. So the parameters here, for instance, are the, probab the probabilities of moving between the states, the actual means and standard deviations of each of the distributions, and frankly, there are some more that I'm brushing, pushing under the rug for now. Okay, how may that look in practice? This is just a quick example. So we have a time series. We look at this. I don't know what to make of it and how to make of it. But if we, would, if we were to run our analysis, we would get something that looks like this. This is, a this is the fitted line from the hidden Markov model, which, which tells us we have two states. 
one with a lower mean, one with a higher mean. And again, mean is first the number, but we have to remember it's just the center of a probability distribution, which, of course, also is characterized by the standard deviation. And the same thing we have to, we have to estimate for the lower mean, okay? So this is just as a quick introduction to hidden Markov models. Now let's try, oh, sorry. And of course, we'll also get the estimated probabilities, which are summarized in a transition matrix. So this is just a quick introduction to the model itself. Let's now look at the data. So stagflation in, re stagflation in orange, buy to build indicator in blue. Again, a simple visual examination. These are non not the smooth series would give us Reasonable, maybe a reasonable intuition on what may be depth and breadth regimes. If we were to run a simple hidden Markov model, the same that I think I described so far, the only difference is that every state is associated with two distributions, one for the stagflation and one for the buy to build index, but the logic, the underlying logic, I think, sufficiently similar for me not to go over a full example of that. We would get, we get these fits. We get, first get that when one is high, when the, un, the buy to build indicator is high, the stagflation and low, and vice versa. We get, these are, I mean, the series are compared to their averages or, or to their trends. So we see that when the buy to build indicator is above its average, the stagflation is below its average. And you say, okay, well, duh, we've seen it in the picture, but I think there is, it gives us, it might give us some uh, further insight. Okay, so if we have, if we look at the regime where the, the orange line is high, and it, I mean, it was named arbitrarily as regime zero in the, in the output of the, the, that, uh, from the computer, we get a positive, uh, a positive mean, and the, in the parentheses we have, always have p-values in my presentation, which are very small, which might suggest that truly the means are not equal to zero. And for the same regime, regime zero, we have a negative uh, buy to build index. And for the alternative regimes, a positive mean for the buy to build index and a negative mean for the stagflation <coughs> index, all with pretty good p values. Now, uh, if we are to try to connect that to our theoretical framework of what is breadth and what is depth, then I would suggest to call regime one as a breadth regime, of course, and regime zero as a depth regime. So if we follow this intuition, we get here the estimated time periods for each of the, each of the alternate regimes, again, all resulting from an automated analysis in a sense. And um, the transition matrix is here, but I want to skip it because I want to leave enough material for questions after the presentation. And for the same reason, I'm going to skip these two slides. And yeah, let me say just a couple of words about selecting dominant capital for my model. So in my first benchmark regression, I started with the top 100 firms, which was a you know, standard, standard choice. But I was wondering if we can do better. What can we say more about the standard choice? And I've, this test is actually a very simplistic <coughs> test in a way. I'm running the same regression, the same benchmark regression of the differential profits of top X firms. And that X is over here, the number of firms that we regress, of that we look at the profits of and regress it on the buy to build indicator and the stagflation indicator. And we just measure the R, the, the, the R squared from this basic regression. We see here that somewhere below 50, this is, these are just the profits of the top 100 firms, we do get a very sharp decline in, this, in the fit, in the, in the results from the regression, somewhere below 50 firms, which is intuitive, which is not surprising. But this gives us, I think, at least one venue of better quantification of what dominant capital might be. I mean, in this case, again, I've, I've done many analyses and trying to show just one particular result. If we do the same type of analysis to the two measures, to the differential employment and the differential profits per employee, we get, not surprisingly, similar results in the depth, in the, in the depth measure because we have already seen that the depth time series 
looks pretty much like the time series for the profits. But the breadth suggested different dynamics. I mean, up to 300 and something firms, still they all profit from the buy to build indicator and the stagflation. I mean, the measure, I mean, up to 300 firms, they still all profit in the um, differential employment measure from these two proxies of buy to build and stagflation, which I think allows us a bit of further insight onto the intracapitalist uh, conflicts and dynamics of breadth and depth. Okay, so taking from, I mean, I said it somewhere below 50 as a Douglas Adams joke. I will, I mean, I think the top, the really highest one was 43, so I've chosen 42 as a Douglas Adams joke. And from now on, I will just look at the differential profits or the differential breadth and depth measures of the top 42 firms. So again, as our refined uh, refined benchmark regression, we regress the differential profits of the top 42 firms, uh, sorry, the differential profits in green of the top 42 firms on the stagflation and the uh, buy to build index. And this is the fitted line. Not, again, similar to the previous picture, not a nice start. And then we run a slightly more sophisticated version of our hidden Markov model, and that's a hidden Markov regression. And a hidden Markov regression I mean, in a Markov switching regression, we associate not the distributions of, for the mean, uh, the, for the mean of the time series, with uh, with a state. We associate the distributions from which parameters for the regression will be drawn. So we have a, actually another level of complexity. We have the hidden, we have the chain. We have on top of that distributions. These distributions, the numbers that are drawn are not the actual observed results, but the unknown parameters for the regression. And all of that, you know, jumbled together is, is somehow supposed to, to create the data that we see and try to estimate. So when we run a Markov switching regression just on the differential profits of the top 42 firms, we get that. The, the, I mean, these are the differential profits of the top 32 firms, and these are the estimated regimes. And the main point that I was hoping and actually did get from these results and that, is that the, the estimated regimes, the, the estimated times for breadth and depth seem pretty similar. If we look at the result from the Markov switching regression, uh, from the two alternative fits from the Markov switch and regression. So again, the green line is the differential profits of the top 32 firms. The blue line is the initial benchmark regression. And the, say, brown line is the fit from the, from the Markov switch and regression, which is, I mean, the, the, the numbers, I have them somewhere here, I may return to, and it's about 0 0.98 uh, correlation coefficient between the fit from the Markov switching regression and the differential profits. So it's a nice result. Let's see what happens when we, again, take this model of Markov switching regression and run it not only with one variable, with, but with the two variables of differential employment and differential profits per employee. And the result, and so that, again, is a slightly different model with four variables, all determined jointly in a sense. And the results that I, we see here are that the, the continuous line are the differential employment of the top 42 firms, the breadth. The brown dashed line is the fit that the model suggests for these regime, for, for this time series. And in light green, we see the estimated times for the breadth regime that the model fits. If we look at the differential employment per employee, again, so the model, so the, the regimes are the same as the previous picture because it's the, determined jointly for the two series. And we have the fit between the continuous line, between the fit to the continuous line is the dashed line. Okay? Good. So, to, in order to try to summarize what I've done so far, so we had a, again, a benchmark regression, which gave, we, we look first at the proxies and we look at the differential measures. And I think that our initial intuitions need, need some assistance or it need, 
can be assisted by a, a more sophisticated model that I'm trying to present here. Um, in this graph, we see, and for that I've done, again, a basic regression, a basic hidden Markov model just for the proxies, a, a Markov switching regression for the proxies and the differential measures uh, themselves. And here I'm looking at the, I'm trying to compare the results from the Markov switching regression in blue from the simple head mark of model in light green. And I'm taking another naive approximation, maybe naive approximation of what the breadth regime may be. And that is looking simply at the time where the stagflation is negative. It's below its average. And I think that this is a pretty encouraging result in a sense because we see that from these different models with different levels of, different levels of complexity, with uh, actually minimum tinkering from my side, I didn't have to do any. I didn't have to do any fits. I mean, I came up with. A, I tried the model, and it in a sense works. We get pretty similar results on what, when, at least from 1950 till 2012, were what we had depth regimes. If we again look at the two time series and compare it to the another to the mirroring of the negative circulation, which is, po which is positive by to build indicator, which is not one-to-one -one because sometimes they're both negative and sometimes they're both positive, we still get the same qualitative picture. Okay? Good. So, quickly to summarize, I presented several models that I think more or less consistently characterize what are breadth and depth regimes in the history of the last 62, I mean, 62 and such years. I think that they are complementary in the sense they build, I mean, they add levels of complexity, but I think re present some results which are robust to some extent. What these models don't do, and we're, I mean, jump from the summary to my open questions, is how to think, or to try to imagine or to think of what could, what could this mean? I mean, so. So let's assume for a second that as a descriptive model, it does a, a nice job. But is it only a descriptive model? I mean, we're actually, we're, I mean, one thing that when you do social science compared to doing physics is that we know that our subjects are, you know, respond, <laughs> react, think, and shape the world according to their ideas. And if the ideas, the nomos of the capitalist ruling class somehow reflects ideas that are similar to what we see on the model, that might also affect the way that they actually act in the future. And in that sense, I think that these descriptive models also could try to pertain to have some, uh, you know, mechanistic or semi-causal uh, uh, explanation about what is going on. And that's, of course, an open question for now. And yeah, and again, once once again, the idea, the the these quantifications seem, you know, kind of out of you know, quick uh, out of the sleeve, but it, it they all touch on very fundamental concepts of the capitalist power approach, which you which are vital for any empirical and theoretical research in the end. And I'm out of time, and that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Um, I just want to congratulate Blair and you too for the great uh, presentations. I want to ask you something technical. You have these shadow lines in your graphs. What do they mean? Oh, they just represent the... Uh, for the most part, they represent the 90% region of the model. So 90% of the data. And you also, but you, because you have also shadow lines for the actual data, so you basically, that's also a data model then. No, well, look, it's, uh, let me just pull it up. I think you're talking probably about Forbes data. It's just, it's just a question. Yeah, uh, it's, um, so for instance, yeah, for example, yeah. here the empirical model has a shadow, which is, so the Forbes data, this is um, about 20 years of data. So oh, it's got okay. a range. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. 
and and it, this is actually the entire range of the Forbes data. Ah, okay. Yeah, I didn't explain that. Another question. Um, you have uh, the parameters to fit the data, but do you have different data sources. Yeah? Or do, is there any relation between uh, these these fitting parameters? Concern. I mean, from from one uh, yeah. graph to another, so so that you can say. I mean, you know, economists build models and they fit uh, some data to the models, but there never seem to be any coherence between different models. So everybody has their own set of parameters, so to say. Yeah, uh, I didn't have time to talk about that. But so this is. For instance, the firm size distribution here. This is the, um, the blue line is the US empirical data. Okay. And so I fitted it with the power law. And um, that's the red. So that's the firm size distribution that I pull the firms from. Um, this is the base pay distribution, which is fitted to CompuStat data. Um, the black line is the, the log normal fit, which is not perfect. It's not even that great. Uh, but So that's the kind of fitted distribution for the base of pay that I use in the model. And then the scaling parameters, there's virtually no data on that. And I can talk about how I kind of, how I derived that. It's, um, maybe we can talk about it after because it's a little okay. bit more complex, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, those were both very interesting presentations. Um, I guess my, my I, the question, uh, one question uh, really for both of you, because um, uh, uh, the second presenter started out by saying uh, all the data is drawn from the US, and I think the same was for the first presenter. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of your conclusions, uh, are there any uh, implications that we should consider for the fact that your data comes from only one version, shall we say, of, uh, of a capitalist organization. Uh, I'm thinking of, for example, the, the question, the link between firm size and, and, and pay, and I, I think about uh, the way that uh, corporations are organized in other countries, Japan, where the, the hierarchies are probably just as many, but the, the, you know, the, the, the scale is much, is much lower. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, should should that should should we think about about the the singular source of your data as having any kinds of uh, connotations or implications for the broader uh, conclusions you want to draw? I'll, I'll just first comment about the uh, the firm the empirical relation between firm pay and size. Is, has enormous amount of data from all over the world. So in that sense, it doesn't matter that I use the US. In terms of talking about hierarchy, we have virtually no data on firms at all because it's all proprietary. And I actually emailed about 10 researchers asking if they'd share their data, and they all said no. <laughs> so um, in that sense, w w it's extremely limited, and the US is almost the only source of data. This, that, which, both. Um, so, it's good. Thank you for your question. I mean, it's uh, something that appears again and again when you try to create these rather abstract categories based on the based on observations from a single country and, to some extent, in, at least in my presentation, from 60 years, which is a very short historical period of time. So. There are two answers. One is, of course, uh, if I have more, if I were to have more data, I'd be happy to to run the same analysis and you know falsify my model if it needs to be. I mean, 
if it if if it's uh, false, I mean, if it's falsifiable. And uh, for Britain, for instance, I was uh, drawing uh, my data from uh, Joe Fran Joseph Francis' work, which also had composed these buy to build indicator and the stagflation indicator for Britain, but I didn't have good enough uh, differential uh, profits measures. So the first immediate answer is, of course, yes, I would like to do that too. Uh, the second answer is. A bit, bit broader in the sense that multi. I mean that these U.S. Multi, I mean these top U.S. firms are multinational. Are called multi. I mean are usually multinationals and are they are, you know, titled so for a very good reason, and in a sense, I mean, you know, are the epicenter of many processes that are global. I mean, think of uh, Joseph Bain's presentation with um, lo which, which looks at the at again, US data for, for, for American firms, but manages to tie it, you know, striking in a, in a very striking way to f food riots all, all over the world. So the, that, I think that suggests that the importance of the validity of analyzing this data some, somewhat out of necessity is, I mean, it still has a wider significance than just the US to some extent. Um, my question is for Blair. Um, so you draw several interesting uh, correlations between top 1% income and corporate dividends. So I'm just wondering whether um, by including stock options for, say, the top tier, like employees in a firm, you're redefining who a capitalist is. Um, so how, so do you think your sort of, what you're trying to do will redefine like dominant capital in the CAS framework? Because I'm wondering how much power those employees actually have vis-a-vis -vis, like, the owners of a company. Um, I, I don't know that it has much to say about dominant capital, because that's at the firm level and really has nothing to say about the individuals within the firm. As far as who is a capitalist, I think political economy has... Um, in some sense, dropped the ball on this because we still have this rigid concept from 19th century political economy that capitalists are the captains of industry. And in some sense, they are, but when you look at the national accounts of who earns national income, or sorry, who earns capitalist income, it's far from clear because, you know, everybody with a mutual fund is earning some dividends. Uh, so, just by virtue of earning some capitalist income, you're not really a capitalist. So it's a gradient. And we think in political economy theory of this dividing line between capitalists and non-capitalists, but in the real world, it's never that clear. There's a gradient. Some people, like Bill Gates, you can say for certain he's a capitalist, but other people it's not clear. So in the model just assumes that gradient um, which I think is how the real world actually works. There's not a dividing line. There's a gradient. Some people earn all of their income from capitalist income. Others don't. As far as how that, what that has to say about how, who controls companies, um, I don't think it has anything to say about that, it really. It's really just about the structure of pay. My comment is on uh, your paper, Shai. I, I look at what you have done and I say, wow. Uh, <laughs> where uh, this uh, simple hypothesis of us has now landed and uh, the kind of the complexity of the analysis of the questions that we originally thought about in much simpler terms now appear to be uh, far more rigorous and uh, and perhaps more complex. And in, in that regard, I think that we need to always be uh, aware that as we develop our, uh, or, or try to seek regularities and find regularities in the way that the world is organized, we have to always uh, keep in mind that 
as we do that, we might want to change the categories themselves. So you still stick to the original formulations that in some sense we have put together, and, and maybe it's time to revisit some of these categories because when you uh, look at the category as dominant capital, you yourself ask, you know, what is the proper magnitude? But maybe the, the measure of uh, differential accumulation itself should be different. Uh, maybe um, the buy to build indicator is not the appropriate measure when you actually want to uh, zero in on the generation of differential profit. So the ratio of mergers and acquisitions has to be somehow analytically first translated into how it affects differential, pro differential profits and figuring out what exactly in that historical process is generating the differential profit. The same thing with stagflation. I mean, maybe inflation is directly related, say, to profit markups, but how is stagnation directly related to profit markups? So these questions suddenly appear to be very pertinent when they were not very pertinent when we just speculated about the kind of broad processes historically and what they might mean. So once you come down to the details, and this is similar, I think, to uh, the issue that we confronted when we started to do our work back in the 80s. We were uh, influenced by Marxism, but when we tried to deal with Marxist categories, we saw that they are not really working. And the same thing here, it's possible that the initial categories we started with are uh, possibly incorrect, but possibly also, more favorably, are just not refined enough. And uh, I think that uh, tomorrow we are going to uh, have another paper uh, by um, Fatima and Volker that question uh, mergers and acquisitions and breadth and depth regimes from uh, a more theoretical perspective, and I think this is pertinent too. So it, it's, I think, something that it requires contemplation before you uh, plunge into data analysis, because you might be trying to model uh, not a sufficiently refined set of concepts, and then you break your head on why it doesn't work. Well, maybe the thing you are trying to model are not suited to what you are actually modeling. Thank you. Yeah. So if I'm may reply quickly. First of all, of course, it's a completely valid comment. I mean, what I didn't get to, I mean, I tried to stick to presenting the results regarding the times of the regimes themselves. There, there, every, I mean, all my, all, all my estimates include estimates for coefficients, which might or might not, which might suggest something about the relation between the, the proxies and the differential measures, which needs to be further analyzed. And so, I, th I mean, so, so more generally, I mean, the theoretical ideas and the empirical work, I think, always have to go hand in hand to some extent. And uh, once you get, once, I mean, there is the danger with these sophisticated models that, you know, you can add just as, you know, add as many parameters as you want and you'll fit everything eventually. And that's, of course, a very serious danger. But, uh, and that's something, I mean, if you look at, I mean, I, I don't think that this result is publishable yet, in a sense. And uh, but if you look at the, you know, how people do things, these people publish things like that. And uh, this is not what I'm trying to do in this presentation and being here and discussing this presentation. I'm hoping to to be able to work to to work with people who have different in, in, insights into the qualitative work and be, be able to cooperate with them and try to develop these notions to their edge and hope and be, being careful not going beyond the edge and, st and starting to, to overfit models that, that are nonsensical. But th these are real concerns and that's part of the process that I'm hoping to be, be taking part of, of course. Time for one last question. Hi, thank you. Uh, question for Shai. Uh, could you elaborate a bit about uh, using uh, your method uh, on uh, getting insights on the struggles inside dominant capital or recognizing the different uh, groups that uh, could be drawn out of it? And specifically, did you compare it uh, 
the, the quantitative analysis of a number of firms and how you choose them to a, maybe a qualitative uh, analysis of uh, sectors or industries? So the, question, the answer is no, I did not break it down yet to sectors or industries. I was trying to, I think that the, the, what, allure, what I find alluring in the concepts of breadth and depth is, is their generality to some extent, and that was my first interest uh, that I wanted to, to play with, with when, uh, when I did these uh, analyses. Uh, the, result, the only result that I yeah, said So the result here, again, I think, is also you have to take it with a bit with a grain of salt because I'm trying to quantify dominant capital based on the qualitative notion that uh, bigger, I mean, dominant capitalists would get would have a stronger relation with a stronger positive relation to the buy to build indicator and the stagflation indicator. So this is a very strong premise in this specific analysis that you have to bear to keep in mind and you know, constantly review theoretically, qualitatively, and empirically. If we, for a minute, take that test, which is almost, I mean, this test with, with all the, with the grain of salt, I think that this is an, is an illuminating result because if, I mean, eventually the correlation for the breadth, for the light gray line also drops. I mean, it's not that it goes indefinitely to for all firms everywhere. I mean, it's just, if I were to present that result, I had to, to spend five minutes on this slide and I didn't want to do it. Uh, so, so for now, it's just a result that comes from the, from the data, but I think opens questions, like you said, about how, how these what would be the dynamics between breadth and depth? I mean, that, again, there's much more in the parameters that I didn't present, but these are all related to, some of it is related to the question that you're asking. Let's have another round of applause for Blair and Shai. <laughs>